across here to get my alternative head, which I'm going to talk to you about later. It was decided not to leave this out because it was too distracting and maybe a little bit too, uh, too ugly. You can only imagine what Heathrow security checks made of that, but luckily it came through. Okay, good morning. Um, and I'd also like to thank Pascal and her colleagues for the inv invitation today and for the help with the setup of, uh, of my slides in particular. A rather bizarre title for the talk, but really, um, following on really quite nicely from the last video, um, working now in product design, a multidisciplinary approach has been very successful for us. And really what I want to talk to you about today is two projects that we've worked on, which are both research projects. Uh, which aren't directly related to health, but as we often find as product designers that working in a multidisciplinary environment, these of often spin off into other products. And in fact, we found quite recently that um, even the robot snake that you'll see today in one of the slides is actually spun off to maybe um, a therapeutic device and maybe interacting with children with autism as well. So th this, these are the things that often happen. So what is product design? All the images you can see here are actually produced by staff at Nottingham Trent University or by our undergraduate and postgraduate students. And if we look from left to right, well, obviously starting on the left, we've got the art-based projects, if you like, the creative side to design. And then we move across to the right and the science-based products related to product design. So the head, as you can see on the right, swarm robotics, which I'm also involved with, the snake robot, which I'll mention today, technical textiles, wearable electronics, bio, biometrics, bio, bio data monitoring, and packaging, furniture, computer peripherals, lighting, and homeware. So we have this cross-disciplinary nature of all these products, which we find that the link between the science and the arts and design can be really beneficial. Again, apologies for the text on this slide. There's quite a lot of it. But really what I'm trying to say in this slide, that we can work together as groups, and I guess a lot of this will be stating the obvious, I, I understand that, but it's amazing how many people don't do this. So designers have certain attributes that are really beneficial. Um, they're trained to think three-dimensionally about form, but they must also understand the complex set of, set of issues that may be involved with a particular environment they're working with. It's about teamwork, it's about working together, and really follows very nicely from the last video that we saw. And this need for designers to understand a wide range of styles and techniques is also critical to development in terms of transforming these ideas into, into new visionary products. One particular material I want to talk about brief today is a shape memory alloy. Some of you may have heard of it. It's been around for a long time as a material. Um, it's usually a nickel titanium alloy that changes shape when it's heated. And that heat can be applied by dropping it in hot water or by applying a voltage or a current. It would change shape or become an actuator. So as you actually apply that voltage, it will actually shrink. And then you take the voltage away, it actually goes back to its original size. You can actually preform a shape, pull it all apart, apply a voltage or reheat that, uh, that, that, uh, that alloy, and it will actually go back to its original shape. It's got some quite good properties. It's been around for quite a long time. And we're using this in the device I'm going to describe now, which is an air muscle. Um, the air muscle, the working principle for this, is really simplistic. Again, it's based on a, a 50s or 60s design. And if you imagine a balloon inside a nylon wire mesh bag, and we place that balloon inside that wire mesh bag, we restrain either end. Obviously, the balloon will expand in diameter, but the actual nominal length will reduce. So again, we get a very simple actuator. And you can see the very simplistic principle uh, in this short video. So we simply inflate the balloon. Obviously, we get this increase in diameter, and that's it. This is the Festo uh, video, which shows they also make an industrial version of this muscle. So, um, again, hopefully some of you will be able to see, you can certainly see them later. We have the industrial version, and if you like, the research version of what we call these air muscles. Festo, a German-based company, this is really the commercial product. Um, you can see straight away one of the big problems with this particular type of technology, if, it's got, if it hasn't got an air supply or no air, compressed air within it, it absolutely has no rigidity. A big downside to this type of device. Um, but on the other hand, there's no moving parts. So compared with some conventional pneumatic devices, it provides a big advantage. Weight for weight, it also can be very advantageous as well. 
So that's the, that's the commercial version. I should say another downside to this is it requires a lot of extra equipment, valves and control valves, to actually make it work as well. On the other hand, the Festo device, uh, sorry, the, um, the Merlin device I'm holding here, uses the shape memory alloy I just spoke about. And uh, apologies, I know most of you can't see this, but this is the device on the right. This is a Presto valve um, from um, a cycle inner tube here. And there's a shape memory alloy attached to it. So by simply applying a voltage to this, we can get the shape memory alloy to contract and allow air to escape. And similarly, at the bottom, we can allow air in. So it's a very simple method of controlling um, these, these muscles. And you can see the analogy as well to our own muscular uh, system. And again here, these are simple rendered images showing on the left the, the muscle in a relaxed state with no air, and on the right, compressed, and obviously that contraction uh, in length acting as an actuator. So I just really as well today, just want to very briefly talk about a couple of projects that we've worked on that involve both of these technologies. The first one um, is Muscle Machine. This was done for an international performance artist called Stellark. And bear in mind, we're product designers, we're not artists. Uh, but we work with a choreographer, control engineers, and various, various people to produce this. This was a six-legged, four-meter diameter robot that gave performances both in Nottingham and in London, UK. Uh, it's here in the 291 Gallery in London. And you can see here... Uh, one of the fluidic muscles here. This is the industrial muscle, don't forget, that's used to lift this leg up and down for movement. And we also have muscles here for rotation of the legs as well. The snake robot utilizes the, uh, the research type muscle. Basically, this is a, a two meter structure. This is a, a graphic image to show, it's a very clean image. You'll see that uh, the final prototype and working model was nowhere near as clean as this. But there's 10 individual segments that run down its length with three muscles per segment to give individual movement. In fact, some analogies link this to a sort of a spinal or vertebra uh, analogy. Here it is with a ballerina. We were lucky enough to present this at the Science Museum in London as well with a, with a ballerina from the London Ballet. Quite interestingly for the press, she said it was the most frightening partner that she'd ever had when she interacted with it. Uh, we were quite concerned as well that something didn't go wrong, but luckily it performed very well on that day. Another close-up image. And again now you can see the muscles in detail for each segment. Of course, these are totally articulated and move around. And you can also see perhaps just there's like a little black structure there. These are quite innovative as well. These are devices that are based on light. So as each segment moves inside these little particular black boxes, there's a reflector and a light. And basically as they move to measure position, it's just a simple change in light intensity. So quite a novel way of measuring movement. This is an early uh, test animation. Um, we were quite lucky because the choreographer wanted very subtle movements. And from a control point of view, it was like it's almost going out of control. But it was a really difficult control problem. It was inherently unstable as, a, as an artifact or as a, uh, as a robot. So it was very, very difficult, difficult to control. But this gives you some idea of the movements that, that we could achieve. So we produced this 10, base, 10 sort of stage robot snake. It was based on this muscle technology I've dis described, and we used ultrasonic and sonar transducers around the base of this robot to detect the presence of individuals and run control algorithms so it actually moved around. But as I said earlier, one of the interesting things for us was that we had a lot of interest beyond, if you like, the art science movement in terms of maybe health applications, maybe uses of the muscles as well. So it was quite an interesting uh, project for us. So moving on to looking at uh, facial paralysis and also to initially to talk about the shape memory alloy I've just mentioned. This particularly relates to a group of, a group of muscles in the face called the, uh, the zygomaticus major, which I've highlighted there. Um, and it's really looking at control uh, within the face to provide some function provided by this group of muscles. Often people lose um, control of their smile, particularly, or we have drooling. You may have seen it, unfortunately, where people's side of their mouth comes down. This may be due to stroke, surgical trauma, or even inf an infection within the face. So what we're doing is trying to look at provide some use back to the patient using smart materials. The problem is that these muscle groups really have little or no chance of spontaneous recovery. So we are not trying, we, under, we don't think provide a complete solution at this stage, but provide some use back to the patient. 
even if it stops drooling, was one of the things that we're trying to achieve. So some of the materials we're looking at, some of them a bit of a mouthful, I agree. Shape memory alloys, ionic electroactive polymers, electroactive polymers, and ionic, ionic polymer metal composites as well as some of the, muscle, uh, some of the, uh, the smart materials that we're examining. This uh, simple um, diagram here, um, the inset, I should say, shows an electromyogram sensor. The, the idea is that I attach that to my face, link it up to the head, and as I smile, basically, it will mimic me and control the smart metal. And you can see that we have, from no smile on the left, this measures the voltage output of the sensor, as you see it in the top left there, to a maximum smile on the right as well. And I think one important thing is we have to remember that when we smile, we don't all smile with a big cheesy clown grin. Often it's quite a subtle smile, just a, smile, a slight movement of the mouth, not a sort of a big open smile. So we have to respect that, uh, that movement as well. This table shows some of the, pro the property differences between electroactive polymers and shape memory alloys. I just really wanted to point out some of the main ones. You can see that their reaction to a stimulus for EAPs is, is, is very low, microseconds to seconds, where it's seconds to minutes for SMA, shape memory alloys. And the power as well can be quite, uh, quite a substantial factor in the choice. So we're very much aware this is not a it's very much a research application. However, there is a potential EAP activation problem. And that problem is, is that sometimes the EAPs require a very high voltage to make them operate. So what we don't want to end up, obviously within the human body, a very high voltage is not really something that we're looking to, uh, that's, what's not really a satisfactory solution, shall we say. And the other material, which I just want to briefly show you, is the, uh, the ionic poly polymer metal composite. And basically we apply a voltage, um, and this, this, this very simple video will show you how it basically just um, moves and retracts. This is a gold-plated sample just being applied with a voltage. And it's a basically a polymer with gold plating on either side. So it just very simply shows you how by applying two volts this time, instead of hundreds of volts, we can get it to move. And this is one of the materials that we're developing now with our industrial partner Merlin uh, in, in the UK to look at possible uh, implantation within the, within the human body. Thank you. This is a simulated x-ray of how the shape memory alloy would sit. Because one of the drawbacks is that because um, of the, to get a five millimeter, five millimeter movement sorry, within the face, we actually have to introduce a 140 millimeter length of shape memory alloy. So the way that we saw that it might work would be, to anchor, be anchored at the back of the skull and obviously anchored at the zygomatic major area as well. The electronics and the control interface could be, be sort of within the loose skin in the neck. And obviously we would take the signal from the damaged side of the face to control the material. The head, which you can see over there, I'm glad to say it's in darkness still, um, is what we're using initially to develop our theories. So the initial head has got um, remote control servers like you might find in, in model airplanes and, and cars, etc. And this is now the, for being used for the development of the interface. So this is being linked to the EMG sensor you saw earlier for testing out um, our interface uh, designs. And again, I'll just quickly show you very, well, very quickly how this would work in this simple animation. So again, you can see the shape memory alloy as part of the animation attached to the back of the skull. We simply activate the shape memory alloy and we have this contraction to basically lift the corner of the mouth. If only it were that simple, but that's, that's the theory. Of course, we all have a dream. And there's a lot of people working on this as well. And also the dream to use uh, these materials as, as pacemakers or within the heart. So certain researchers already uh, have done work on using these cages um, for, um, for controlling the heart. So we could see a cage maybe in the future, a lot more complex than this, around the heart, acting as a pacema pacemaker, um, as some sort of smart materials. So this basically shows you in a very simplistic form how, how that may work. As I say, most people spend their lives devoted to developing uh, uh, this type of procedure. I think the multidisciplinary approach is very important. For me, it's very important. You saw the, the first slide where, where, we, where we digress, if you like, from art to science and the cross-disciplinary nature of that. 
But as the previous video said, the knowledge of and the experience of the user must never be dis discounted, really, as part of the design process. And for medical equipment, that's particularly important. Um, a, a good example, it's a very simplistic example with um, a surgeon that I'm lucky enough to be working with, working on a cranial surgery with a laser. The visor for the, for the laser, which he had to use when he was obviously undertaking a process, mean that, meant that he couldn't see cranial bleeding. I mean, just something as simple as that, talking to the surgeon, talking to the clinician about the design of this sort of equipment. So it's really important to have this understanding and this communication. So industrial design links in the UK, we're very lucky to have industrial networks, innovation networks that we can be part of. And these are essential for effective design and development. We're, this allows basically physicians, designers and manufacturers to work together, um, obviously, for positive outcomes. It's about sharing of vision and ideas. And it's about integration of new technologies and materials in an appropriate manner. And I think for me, uh, I'm very fortunate to work with a, with a paediatric neurosurgeon back in the UK. I'm also part of the INETS. I work with industry. We have medical networks and knowledge transfer net networks within the UK. And working with those, I think, gives me lots of ideas, allows me to put my ideas across um, in a way of moving forward and producing, hopefully, very innovative um, and forward-facing products uh, for the healthcare market in the future. Thank you.